The, the committee will come to order. Pursuant to notice, we meet today to mark up eight measures. <clears throat> Without objection, the chair is authorized to declare a recess of the committee at any point. Pursuant to committee rule four, the chair announces that the chair may postpone further proceedings on approving any measure or matter or adopting an amendment. Without objection, all members may have five days to submit statements or extraneous materials on today's business. As members were notified yesterday, we intend to consider today's measures and amendments on block. At this time, I recognize myself to speak on today's business. Let me first of all say that I'm pleased to support all of the measures before us today, and I thank our members for their hard work. I want to start by discussing three bipartisan resolutions I introduced with Ranking Member McCall that outline what I see as the three pillars that uphold the successful, uniquely American foreign policy. <clears throat> first, House Resolution 222 reaffirms the importance of America's alliances and partnerships. We're much better positioned to defuse crises, to respond to global challenges like climate change and deadly pandemics, and to push back against aggressive regimes and other threats when we're standing shoulder to shoulder with our friends and allies. <clears throat> The second resolution, House Resolution 221, makes clear that human rights, democracy, and the rule of law should be at the center of our foreign policy. Our actions abroad should reflect our country's spirit of generosity and compassion, the development efforts that help countries and communities lift themselves up, that help people grow enough food to feed their communities, that push governments to become more open and accountable. These are the right things to do, and it's also the smart thing to do. Countries that are freer and more inclusive with economies that are thriving and justice systems that are fair tend to be more stable and better partners for the U.S. We see an example of this with Mr. Malinowski's bill, the Saudi Arabia Human Rights Accountability Act. Saudi Arabia is an important security partner, but we cannot just look the other way when they ignore international norms and basic human rights. The horrific murder of Jamal Khashoggi demands accountability and justice. After the astounding evidence we've seen, it cannot just be business as usual, and since the administration is dragging its feet on taking any meaningful action, Congress must step forward. That brings me to our third pillar resolution, HRS 220, which recognizes the importance of diplomacy and development to our national security and supports a strong international affairs budget. I was pleased to work closely with Ranking Member McCall along with our appropriations colleagues, Chairwoman Lowy and Ranking Member Rogers, in authoring this resolution. For the last two years, Congress has come together in a bipartisan manner to reject the administration's effort to slash funding for our diplomacy and development efforts. This resolution recognizes the important work our diplomats and development professionals do and the need to continue to demonstrate American leadership and values and promote U.S. interests through the international affairs budget. We shouldn't forget when we're talking about diplomacy, we're talking about people. We're talking about women and men and families who are willing to live in far-flung places and sometimes face great dangers because they've all answered the call to serve. We need to make it clear to these dedicated public servants and to the rest of the world that the United States understands the value of diplomacy. And we need to give our personnel the support and resources they need to carry out this important work. This affects America's national security and our partner nations around the globe. And how do we bring all of this to life? How do we advance our foreign <laughs> policy interests and empower our diplomatic institutions to do the work? Well, we need a fully authorized, reinvigorated State Department. Every year, the National Defense Authorization Act is considered a must-pass bill. But it's been 17 years, let me repeat that, 17 years since the State Department authorization has been signed into law. From my time as ranking member with Chairman Ed Royce, it's been my goal to make authorizing the State Department a regular part of this committee's work. We need to get the State Department authorization to become a must-pass bill, like the NDAA, because we know that diplomacy, along with defense, is critical to our national security. So I'm proud that today we're marking up the State Department Authorization Act that I introduced with Mr. McCall. There's no difference in the way Mr. McCall sees this and the way I see this. This bipartisan <coughs> bill strengthens the management and operations of the Department of State, 
including provisions to recruit and retain a diverse workforce, bolster embassy and information security, and improve the Department's public diplomacy, anti-corruption, and security assistance efforts. And today's measure is just the beginning, laying the foundation for our committee's work in the years to come to keep the State Department strong and ensure that our diplomacy and development workforce can best advance American foreign policy. I especially want to thank Grant Mullins on the ranking member's staff and Laura Carey on my staff for their incredible efforts in shepherding this bill through committee. Again, I'm pleased to support all of the measures on today's markup, and I urge all members to join me in doing so, and I'll now recognize our ranking member, Mr. McCall of Texas, for his remarks. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I want to thank you for your hard work and once again demonstrating that this committee is the most bipartisan committee uh, in the Congress. Uh, today, our committee will consider eight measures, including the Department of State Authorization Act. This committee is not considered a state authorization bill since 2013, and the last comprehensive authorization bill became law in 2002. I'm pleased that these bipartisan bill builds on the text that former Chairman Royce introduced last year and includes several legislative proposals from uh, members on my side of the aisle. I support this bill, which reasserts Congress's constitutional Article I authority to give direction to the department. It is vital that the committee that has a constitutional authority to declare war better express our oversight. And that is exactly what we are doing here today. Specifically, it provides for cost-saving measures in embassy construction, streamlines and eliminates some special envoys, eliminates outdated and duplicative reports, and authorizes anti-corruption programming, among other necessary provisions. It also ensures the efficiency of various department programs by mandating rigorous success measuring metrics. I'd also like to thank Mr. Kinzinger for introducing the protecting Europe's Energy Security Act. Vladimir Putin is not our friend. He's an enemy. And Putin continues to use energy and gas as weapons against Europe. There's no worse example of this tactic than the Nord Stream 2 pipeline, which would allow Russia, if it chooses to do so, to hold Europe hostage. And that is why this bill that we are considering today is so important because it would employ very targeted sanctions on companies that are currently participating in laying the underwater portion of Nord Stream 2 pipeline. At a time when Vladimir Putin is using all of his tactics to sow discord and chaos around the world, including among our European allies, we need to work together to stop these actions from impacting our national security interests and cooperation with our transatlantic allies. I proudly support this bill, which delivers a blow to Russia's weaponization of energy in Europe and around the world. I also want to thank Mr. Smith for his work on the End Neglected Tropical Diseases Act. I'm proud to be an original co-sponsor of this bill that supports international efforts to treat and eradicate neglected tropical diseases with no additional cost to the taxpayer. Again, Mr. Chairman, let me uh, convey my uh, gratitude and appreciation for you and your leadership uh, in getting good things done for the on behalf of the American people uh, and our foreign policy. Uh, and this is, I believe, the way Congress uh, should and is supposed to work. And with that, I yield back. Thank you, Mr. McCall. I agree with everything you just said and uh, pleased to uh, work closely with you. And uh, this product, as I mentioned before, is the product of, of cl close collaboration between bo on both sides of the aisle. And uh, I think the finished product is a great, great product. Are there any other members seeking recognition? Ms. Ms. Bass. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chair, for your leadership and the ranking member. Uh, I wanted to speak uh, about the resolution H.R. 358, calling on the government of Cameroon and armed groups to respect the human rights of all Cameroonian citizens to end all violence and to pursue a broad-based dialogue without preconditions to resolve the conflict in the northwest and southwest regions. The situation in Cameroon continues to decline, and to be frank, 
Congress, the international community, and Cameroonian citizens who I receive regularly in our office, either in person or by phone, are concerned about where this country is heading. The tensions in the Anglophone region are not new. People have felt disenfranchised and marginalized since the end of colonialism. But as we heard, the current situation arose in late 2016 after the government was heavy-handed in its response to the Anglophone protest movement, killing protesters, arresting hundreds, and deploying government security forces. On the other side, the Anglophone movement has also transformed. There are elements that are now a separatist movement. Separatists have become more and more militant and have been accused of committing abuses, including killing security forces, attacking and burning down schools, and attacking citizens. People in the Anglophone region feel deeply wounded over the course of the last week or so in my office. We have received hundreds of calls from people saying that there is genocide in the Anglophone region. Meanwhile, the government has said that there is no one to negotiate with and the separatists do not want to come to the table. What this says to me is that there is serious work to be done to bring both sides to the table to end this conflict and to determine whether or not genocide is actually taking place. I do not aim to tell this country what to do. What we here in Congress want to do is to encourage dialogue in order to make sure that Cameroon is not the site of a civil war. The government must recognize that it is facing a real national crisis and the international community is watching. And activists must realize that peaceful nonviolent protest is the only way to get people to hear their cause. This resolution, HRES 358, calls on the government of Cameroon and armed groups to respect the human rights of all Cameroonian citizens, to end all violence and to pursue a broad-based dialogue without preconditions to resolve the conflict in the Northwest and Southwest regions. I encourage my colleagues to support this resolution and to send the message to Cameroon and the world that we remain engaged in the world. Um, I also want to express my uh, support for the legislation HR 3460 in Neglected Tropical Disease Act that um, Representative Smith has worked on for a number of years. Uh, I am uh, glad that we are voting on it today in this markup but I also look forward to the second half of the bill being discussed and marked up in another committee and taking both sides of the bill to passage on the floor. With that, I yield back. Thank you, Ms. Bass. Mr. Smith. <clears throat> Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman. Thank you again, you and uh, Michael McCall, for working in such a bipartisan way. I do want to associate my remarks strongly with uh, Chairwoman Bass uh, on the Cameroonian a resolution. It's an excellent resolution. One year ago, tomorrow, I chaired a hearing joined by my then ranking member, and we've been absolutely seamless in our concern about what's happening in Cameroon. Uh, we heard about this growing crisis of the Cameroonian government cracking down on individuals uh, who were Anglophone. Uh, it's amazing that there could be such a divide, uh, and yet the loss of life has been horrific. So I want to thank her for her, her tremendous uh, resolution. I'm very proud to be one of the 41 co-sponsors, but I do thank her for that. Let me also say thank you, Mr. Chairman and Ranking Member, for uh, bringing the Neglected and Neglected Tropical Diseases Act uh, to the committee. Uh, and again, Karen Bass, Gregory Meeks, thank you for your co-sponsorship of this. As I think most members may know, um, Neglected Tropical Diseases, or NTDs for short, are a group of 17 parasitic and bacterial diseases which blind disable, disfigure, and sometimes kill victims. They, they open up people to opportunistic uh, diseases as well. Uh, and usually malaffects the world's poorest people, trapping the most marginalized communities in cycles of poverty. These diseases can keep children from attending school and their parents from working and causes excessive bleeding by mothers during birth, resulting in low birth weight babies. NTDs also constitute a significant hurdle to achieving economic growth. Uh, when large numbers of people are malaffected, it, it leads to real, real negative impacts to uh, the ability to go to school, and those children, as they matriculate into adulthood, uh, find it very hard to get jobs uh, going forward. We know what's happening even in our own country with West Nile virus, dengue fever, uh, and most, more recently with Zika. Uh, the most common NTDs can be controlled and eliminated, um, and I won't go into too much detail, but you know there are three 
worms, roundworm, whipworm, and hookworm, that alone constitute about 1.5 million people, uh, one, uh, not one, 1 1.5 billion people around the world, who carry in their intestines worms. And these are mostly children, malaffected again by this horrible, horrible uh, list of diseases. Uh, there's also a number of other um, uh, diseases, I won't go into all the details, but every one of them uh, hurts people so severely, particularly in Africa and in Latin America. And to give you an example, the cost of treating uh, just one hookworm is four cents. Four cents. I mean, talk about being able to um, uh, eliminate misery uh, for pennies on the dollar, four cents uh, to treat it. We also want to work on it systemically. This legislation, a whole government approach with um, incorporating or integrating water sanitation and health, the WASH programs, uh, also seeks to do that. Let me also just commend USAID for the work they've done in getting contributions from the pharmaceutical companies, now almost to the point of $19 billion in value. Um, uh, GlaxoSmithKline and J&J &J and Merck uh, have been great partners in trying to mitigate this misery throughout the world. And as my good friend and colleague uh, Karen Bass said a moment ago, we are, there is another aspect to this bill which would establish centers of excellence. Uh, that has been held up by the Energy and Commerce Committee for six years. Uh, we are at least moving this part of the bill uh, separately to try to get this uh, further uh, promoted by this Congress. We spend about $102 million. Uh, Barack Obama looked to cut it down to $80 million. This current president, President Trump, also would cut it. Every time the appropriators, uh, and we've weighed in on with them strongly, uh, have gotten back to the 100 million uh, plus figure for NTDs. I frankly think it should be higher, but again, this strategy bill, I think, will move us in that direction. I thank my friends and yield back. Thank you, Mr. Smith. Mr. Sherman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'll address the um, latter seven bills first and then return to the State Department authorization bill. It is wise that we are, and as to the latter seven bills, I'm uh, pleased to co-sponsor all of them. Um, it's time that we recognize the importance of diplomacy and development in our foreign policy, and we spend only one quarter of one percent of our GDP on foreign aid. This money is the best money we invest in our own security and in our meeting our moral obligation to poor people around the world. The next resolution recognizes the importance of democracy, human rights, and the rule of law, particularly important with one-third of the world's population living in what is described as backsliding democracies. The next resolution recognizes the importance of our alliances and partnerships. I want to commend uh, Ms. Bass for her resolution regarding Cameroon, where there are over 500,000 displaced uh, persons and hundreds of deaths, and the resolution appropriately urges uh, both the government and separatist groups to engage in broad-based dialogue without preconditions. Uh, uh, Mr. Milanowski has put forward a, uh, a good resolution regarding uh, those responsible for the death of Jamil Khashoggi uh, by denying them visas. It is also, I also want to mention, as I always do, the importance of preventing Saudi Arabia from developing a nuclear weapon in the uh, Science Committee yesterday, the Secretary of Energy promised to give to this committee, as well as the Science Committee, any further Part 810 uh, licenses that are issued to allow American companies to share nuclear uh, dis technology in their discussions with Saudi Arabia. Um, uh, H.R. 3206 focuses on the real threat, I think, to, to NATO of making Germany and other parts of Central Europe uh, dependent upon a pipeline for natural gas, a pipeline that comes from Russia. And finally, Mr. Smith, I think, well described the importance of H.R. 3460 uh, to end uh, ne uh, neglected tropical diseases. As to the State Department authorization bill, I think we'd all co-sponsor it, except the uh, leadership has decided to just have one sponsor and one co-sponsor, and that is, uh, uh, that is a, certainly a reasonable approach. As uh, has been pointed out, the State Department last had an authorization bill in 2002. We have in Congress authorization committees and appropriations committees. 
only in the foreign policy area has the authorization committee been pushed to the side to this degree. We can't let it continue. This bill and passing it into law is the first step to do in foreign policy what we do in other areas, for example, defense policy, where the NDAA bill is, is, uh, plays a, a critical role in uh, outlining our defense operations and, uh, and objectives. We need to have the same role for this committee when it comes to foreign policy. Not only do we need to annually pass into law a State Department authorization bill, and I commend the Chairman and the Ranking Member for getting us this far, and I think get it, probably getting us all the way there, is we need to, to have an authorizing bill uh, for our foreign assistance. It was in 1961 that Congress passed the Foreign Assistance Act. Since the 1980s, Congress has not passed a full-scale authorization bill, uh, nor a full rewrite of the 61 Act. We've dealt with particular crises, uh, such as uh, the AIDS crisis, uh, but if our foreign aid dollars are going to be spent effectively, and if our foreign policy is going to reflect the values of 2019 and 2020, rather than the values in 1961, we need to have an authorization bill uh, in the foreign assistance area as well. So uh, I look forward to joining with the chairman and the ranking member in a, uh, what I think will have to be a long-term process of making sure that our operations in foreign policy are uh, uh, influenced uh, by this committee, uh, just as every other authorizing committee authorizes the uh, programs under its jurisdiction. I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Sherman. Mr. Kinziger. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I'll mercifully keep this under five minutes. Uh, over the years, we've watched Vladimir Putin weaponize natural gas across the region. Through intimidation and coercion, Russia has tried to use energy dependence as a means to hold our European allies hostage, and this is something we all know. The completion of the Nord Stream 2 and Turk Stream pipelines would further endanger millions of Europeans destabilizing the continent. I introduced H.R. 3206, the Protecting Europe's Energy Security Act, with Representatives Heck and Pence to prevent this from happening. My legislation would impose targeted sanctions on pipeline vessels to stop the construction of Nord Stream 2 and the Turk Stream projects. By targeting the pipeline ships, we would stop the work in its tracks, but not allow for unintended consequences against the economies of our allies in Europe. The United States must stand with our NATO and EU allies to protect our shared values and security, by pushing back against Putin's power grab. Luckily, many European nations realize the danger that these pipelines would pose to their security. Allies like Poland, Denmark, Ukraine, and the UK have all expressed opposition to Russian's dominance of the European energy market. And on a side note, I'll just mention that our energy explosion has been very beneficial, as we've seen our natural gas, our LNG exports, uh, only be limited by the lack of infrastructure to export them. However, Germany, a cornerstone of our transatlantic alliance, is using the Nord Stream 2 project to gain a competitive advantage over their EU partners. Actions like these undoubtedly strain European cohesion. To ensure American and European interests are protected, I also offered a clarifying amendment to ensure that nothing in this bill would affect pipelines that originate outside of the territory of Russia. In March, I introduced H.R. 1616, the European Energy Security and Diversification Act with Chairman Keating, to incentivize European nations to develop their own domestic energy sources. This committee unanimously passed that legislation and it received overwhelming bipartisan support on the floor. These two, build, these two bills acting as a carrot and a stick would ensure that America's European allies are protected from Russia's malign use of energy as a weapon. I wanna thank Chairman Engel and Ranking Member McCall for bringing the Protect Europe's Energy Security Act before us today and I urge my colleagues to support this very important legislation. And with that, I'll yield back my time. Thank you, Mr. Kinziger. Mr. Keating. I'd like to thank the chair. Thank you, Mr. Chair and the ranking member, and significantly uh, our staff for all their work uh, leading us to this markup and bringing forward the state authorization bill, as well as the other important pieces of legislation that have been referenced already. Uh, at a time when there's great uncertainty around the world, we should be doing as much as we can to coordinate with our partners on democracy and human rights uh, on issues of uh, anti-corruption, rule of law, humanitarian assistance, trade and investment. In all these efforts, the United States should lead by example to ensure greater rights and inclusion for women, minorities, 
marginalized populations, and LGBTI individuals. This is critical to our own security as well as many of our core values that are central to our democracy. That's why my amendments aim uh, to promote the roles of civil society and women in advancing peacekeeping efforts, improving the rule of law, strengthening democratic institutions, as well as assist our partners in their efforts to combat corruption and screen foreign investments to better counter Russia and China, Chinese influence. At hearings uh, I held as subcommittee chair uh, with my ranking member on Europe and Eurasia, energy and environment, we, we heard concerns from bipartisan experts about China's efforts to control security infra infrastructure and Russia's malign influence in economic activities. Screening potential foreign investments for national security concerns is key to protecting our economies and our security and a longstanding practice in this country. We should be doing more to ensure U.S. allies are taking the necessary steps to protect their security infrastructure, their institutions and financial systems from foreign threats, and by extension, protecting the American people as well by sharing information, best practices, technical assistance. Likewise, corruption is a problem that affects every country, and we should be working together on anti-corruption efforts to hold all those accountable for their role in kleptocracies. Corruption does not stop at borders, and the strength of our partnership in this regard is key to successfully eliminating corruption. I'd like to thank Again, the Chairman Engel, Ranking Member McCall, for including these amendments in, uh, on block and their support for this act and ensuring that U.S. foreign policy is advancing greater democracy, security, and prosperity at home and abroad. I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Keating. Mr. Pence. Mr. Chairman, I'm proud to join Congressman Kinzinger as an original co-sponsor of H.R. 3206. The energy security of our partners, particularly our NATO partners, is essential to our security as well as theirs. The Nord Stream 2 project represents a threat to the progress many NATO partners have made on energy security issues, and this legislation is a prudent step in preventing this dangerous project from being completed. I hope all my colleagues will join us in supporting this legislation. Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Pence. Mr. Meeks. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I want to uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, uh, for working with me uh, to continue to push uh, for oversight and advancement of diversity in this, at the State Department that includes everything from a new foreign service officers coming in to taking steps to see that there's increased diversity at the highest ranks. Uh, I look forward to continuing to work on this issue in a bipartisan way and hope that as members of Congress travel, they are able to see the diversity in our diplomats that represent us. Right now on the Hill, uh, there are Wrangell Fellows that will be the next generation uh, of, of diplomats that will continue that progress. And I think that speaks well about who we are as a nation and as a people uh, when they see that kind of diversity because uh, that is uh, the example that uh, we, we can set uh, for, for many. I also uh, just want to say that in uh, a number of the other bills, uh, recognizing the, inter the interdependence of, diplom of diplomacy, development, and defense as criti to critical to our effective national security. You know, as had been said, you know, all of the money and all of the efforts that we can put into diplomacy is tremendously important. You know, so, uh, there was general who said you can either put it into diplomacy or put it into bullets. I think that we are all better off when we put it into diplomacy and then trying to make sure that diplomacy is, um, is, is an integral part, if not even a leading part, of what our public uh, national security is all about. Uh, I think it is uh, by far in a ever shrinking world um, when you talk about geogra geographically, you can get to one place uh, within the, almost around the world within 12 hours. So being able to diplomatically work together with uh, those around the sphere, particularly our allies, are uh, extremely important. I also want to say that to end uh, Neglected Tropical Diseases Act, and uh, I want to thank Ms. Uh, Bass and Mr. Smith 
uh, for working on this is extremely important when you look at number of diseases that should be wiped off this planet. And as one of the co-chairs of the In Malaria Now Caucus, uh, it is something that we've got to continually stay, fo stay focused on so that uh, these diseases are diseases that should not be anywhere on this planet. Uh, we have the ways to make sure that it is cured. It is also, particularly on, you know, when you think about malaria on the continent of Africa, you know, the, the, the lives that are lost and the potential that is gone. So uh, that bill, Mr. Smith and Ms. Bass, that have been working on is, uh, is, is tremendously important. Uh, glad that that is in here. Uh, Saudi Arabia Human Rights and Accountability Act. We do have to hold individuals accountable uh, in other countries for uh, their actions. Uh, we cannot turn our back in any circumstances uh, against anyone uh, when there are huge violations of human rights. And so the Saudi Arabia Human Rights Accountability Act of 2019 is extremely important. Likewise, H HRES 358, calling on the government of Cameroon and armed groups to respect the human rights of all Cameroonian citizens to end all violence and to pursue a broad-based dialogue without preconditions to resolve the conflict in the Northwest and Southwest regions is extremely important. Uh, and I think that it is something, again, that we can continue to work on uh, on a continuous basis, and we need to make sure that governments that are in this kind of struggle, we need to speak out and loud and letting them know that we're calling on uh, the human rights of all citizens, and definitely there in Cameroon. Emphasizing the importance of ally alliances and partnerships. You know, I don't know anything better. When the world, when we become, you know, I find more interdependent upon one another, we generally have a more peaceful and better place and a better world in which we live in. And so to emphasize the importance of alliances, uh, we need to make sure that we strengthen the alliances that we currently have, for example, with our allies uh, in Europe, our, our uh, allies in Central and South America, our allies uh, like Japan uh, and like uh, South Korea. Uh, those are allies and those are relationships that helps make us all stronger and to emphasize the need and the importance of these alliances like NATO is tremendously important and I am proud to support that uh, that's in this legislation. Uh, and I would just hope uh, in closing that as we look at uh, the sanctions with respect to provisions of certain vessels for the construction of Russian energy and export pipelines that we make sure that we include our allies in that dialogue and conversation and we're not just doing something without working with them. And I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Meeks. Mr. Shabbat. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I want to thank you and the ranking member, Mr. McCall, for your hard work to put forward a bipartisan State Department authorization bill. Um, this markup today will put us on track to pass an authorization for the State Department for the first time since 2002 uh, when Henry Hyde was chair of this committee. Uh, it's something that I think we can all be proud of. Um, we're, while there are things in the bill that I don't like or uh, that I don't think are uh, necessary, um, that's the byproduct of bipartisan negotiation and compromise, something I think we need more of these days. Um, I'd just like to highlight a few important common sense provisions in the bill. First, uh, the bill requires that special envoys be confirmed by the Senate. Our founding fathers required that Congress approve key officials, and the current loophole diminishes our constitutional oversight role and our influence over foreign policies. Uh, this would be especially helpful should we have another uh, president like our previous one. Uh, whose attitude about going around Congress was pretty much standard operating procedure. Second, the bill has several provisions to enhance good governance at the State Department, whether it's requiring the Department to implement more GAO recommendations, ensuring that new embassies don't cost the taxpayer more than they should, or closing some of our less necessary facilities overseas. The bill takes some critical long overdue steps. As someone who believes that the federal government is extremely bloated and wasteful, uh, these sorts of common sense policies might not grab headlines, but they certainly mean that we did our job and don't have to take quite as much in taxes from hardworking Americans. Finally, over on the Judiciary Committee, where I just came from, uh, we've seen just what happens when computers and how to handle data policies aren't clearly articulated. 
uh, whether it's uh, Hillary Clinton's homebrew server or Lois Lerner's emails that mysteriously disappeared, or the text that the FBI lost between Peter Strzok and Lisa Page, it's clear that the federal government needs better IT management. Section 504 goes a long way to preventing something like uh, Hillary's email uh, debacle to ever occur uh, again or something like it uh, at the State Department. Furthermore, uh, the rest of Title V uh, is also important as it requires the Secretary to strengthen the State Department's defenses against cyber attacks. So there's a lot of sound policy in this bill, and it's good to finally be voting on a State Department authorization again. I'd also like to briefly mention, <coughs> excuse me, two of the other bills uh, we have before us today. First, I want to touch on Mr. Malinowski's Saudi Arabia Human Rights and Accountability Act. And I want to thank him for seeking to address the brutal murder of Jamal Khashoggi. Um, as co-chair of the Freedom of the Press Caucus, I don't think uh, we can condemn the murder of Mr. Khashoggi strongly enough, especially in light of the new UN report. I also want to thank Mr. McCall for working on an amendment uh, to place the bill in the broader context of our bilateral relationship with the Saudis, which remains critical to U.S. interests in the region, especially as Iran continues to display such reckless behavior. Finally, I want to take a moment to thank Mr. Kinziger for uh, his attention to the Nord Stream 2 pipeline. Some of our European allies are willing to make believe that increasing dependence on Russian gas is just fine in exchange for cheap energy. This is the last thing Europe needs right now, especially as Vladimir Putin seeks to reestablish Russia as a preeminent global power. Thank you, and I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Chabot. Mr. Cicilline. Thank you, Chairman Engel and Ranking Member McCall for holding this markup today and once again doing it in a bipartisan fashion. Uh, as we weigh in on, as a committee on issues of the utmost importance to the foreign policy priorities of the United States, and I too would like to acknowledge the staff of the committee for their hard work. The bills we have before us today signals this committee's continued commitment to the principles of diplomacy, development, democracy, human rights, and the rule of law, as well as reaffirming the importance of our international alliances and partnerships. Of this, we must be clear. It's also beneficial for this committee to reaffirm our commitment to these principles, but I wish it weren't so necessary as this moment when it seems like the current administration has ventured quite far from our founding principles. As the President and Secretary of State spend time courting dictators like Kim Jong-un and Mohammed bin Salman and praise right-wing leaders like Viktor Orban, there is currently no clarity about the United States' position on human rights, democracy, and universal values. So I thank the Chairman and Ranking Member for giving us this opportunity to be clear. The United States Congress supports building alliances, we support diplomacy, we support human rights and representative government and women's rights and LGBTI rights and the rights of religious minorities and other vulnerable communities around the globe. And when a government and a leader is responsible for the brazen murder of an American resident, a journalist, we won't back down because it became inconvenient. I'm proud to support Mr. Malinowski's bill, the Saudi Arabia Human Rights and Accountability Act of 2019 as a co-sponsor and hope that the administration will begin to take real steps to address the horrific murder of Jamal Khashoggi at the hands of the Saudi government, as well as other very well-documented human rights abuses. And underscoring the necessity of passing this bill are the foundings of the UN Special Rapporteur who investigated the Khashoggi killing and in the report uh, it concludes Mr. Khashoggi's killing constituted an extrajudicial killing for which the state of the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia is responsible. His attempted kidnapping would also constitute a violation under international human rights law. They go on to say the Special Rapporteur has determined that there is credible evidence warranting further investigation of high-level Saudi officials in high-level uh, Saudi officials' individual liability, including the Crown Prince's. And so uh, the, the timing of this couldn't be more appropriate. I'm pleased to support all the bills before the committee today, and particularly want to thank the Chairman and Ranking Member for giving us the opportunity to vote for the State Department Authorization Bill for the first time in many years, an important step to ensuring that the State Department can operate efficiently and adapt to the times. And again, thank you for your leadership, and I yield back the balance of my time. Thank you, Mr. Cicilline. Mr. Reschenthaler. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I was fortunate to serve alongside the brave men and women of the State Department during my time in Iraq. And I also know firsthand how living in a combat zone take, 
takes its toll. During my time in Baghdad, I made daily trips in the red zone to prosecute terrorists in the Iraqi court system. And I know that rest and recuperation, or R&R, &R, are essential to functioning at a high operation tempo. Currently, the State Department is limited in its authority to grant administrative leave to personnel serving in combat zones or high threat, high risk posts. This is especially problematic for locations where travel is difficult, unpredictable, and full of delays. These logistical challenges require employees to use personal leave or leave without pay for the time spent on official travel to and from R&R destinations. The status quo is not only unfair to these employees, but unsafe if it prevents them from getting proper R&R. So this is why I'm offering an amendment to the State Depart Department Authorization Act, which would create a category of leave for R&R breaks like those, of the state, that, like those at the Department of Defense for combat zones, uh, high risk and high threat posts. In addition, I'd like to thank the committee for including my legislation in the Diplomatic Personnel Modernization Act uh, in this bill. It will require a five-year staffing plan for the Department of State to ensure organization and efficiency within the agency to help them carry out the great work they're doing around the world. So thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I yield back the balance of my time. Thank you, Mr. Reschenthal, and Mr. Barra. Thank you, Chairman Engel and Ranking Member McCall for your important work on this legislation. I also, um, in addition, want to thank the staff, folks like Laura Carey, who works for Chairman Engel, for really getting this done. In my capacity as Chairman of Oversight Investigations Subcommittee, we've already begun to dive into many of these important issues and recognize as we look at personnel issues, et, et, et cetera, um, our job is to conduct oversight and provide guidance, but at the same time, not micromanage state or oversaturate them with important re re reporting requirements. Thus, as we go into the, the rest of this Congress, we plan to dive further into these core questions related to authorities the department has been requesting of us for years. I also want to thank the chairman and ranking member for including my amendment to the State Department authorization bill. This amendment is simple. It requires the State Department to report on changes it makes to the Foreign Affairs Manual. The Foreign Affairs Manual essentially is the State Department's own internal regulatory document. These regulations dictate how our diplomats conduct their work. It touches on many of the areas that the bill seeks to address, like staffing. Essentially, the Foreign Affairs Manual, for instance, lays out the process for creating positions at our overseas missions abroad. But the Foreign Affairs Manual also regulates consular and immigration services that the State Department provides. So these changes directly impact not only our diplomats abroad, but also Americans and their families here at home. Thus, it's critically important that Congress know how the State Department is changing this important document. I again thank both Chairman Engel and Ranking Member McCall for including this amendment and block and for your important work on this legislation. And with that, I yield back. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Barra. Mr. Guest. Okay, gentleman passes. Yes, sir, I pass. Thank yeah. you, Mr. Chairman. Okay. Uh, Ms. Titus. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and Ranking Member McCall for holding this hearing and for your leadership in having Congress uh, address the State Department authorization bill. I support this legislation to strengthen operations at the State Department, increase its ability to recruit and retain a diverse workforce, and provide authority for important offices doing critical work, like the Office of Global Women's Issues and the Office of International Disability Rights. I especially thank you both for working with me to add language to the bill, enhancing the Office of International Disability Rights, and expressing Congress's intent to ensure that our embassies and consulates abroad are balancing security with accessibility for persons with disabilities. More than one billion people around the world have a disability, 80% of those live in developing countries. 
60% of persons with disabilities are women, and women with disabilities are more likely to experience sexual violence than women without disabilities. There are more than 90 million children with disabilities worldwide, and children with disabilities are more likely to be malnourished than children without. Disability rights cut across all sectors, including democracy, human rights, labor, global health, education, and disaster relief. The International Disability Rights Team, which under this bill would permissibly be authorized as an official office, provides guidance on making democracy and human rights activities more inclusive, encourages foreign governments to combat discrimination, promotes disability inclusive practices and training of State Department staff, and ensures emergency planning and humanitarian aid are accessible to persons with disabilities. The team also has been fundamental in gathering and producing information for the State Department's annual human rights and human trafficking reports. Elevation of this team to an established office will enhance its capacity to be influential within the department and to serve as a resource for other departments and agencies that engage in international work. I also want to thank Mr. Malinowski for his leadership on the Saudi Arabia Human Rights and Accountability Act and our chair and ranking member for allowing the committee to hold Saudi Arabia accountable for its human rights abuses. From the murder of the journalist to arbitrary arrest, censorship, ongoing detention and abuse of women's rights activists, the death penalty for consensual same-sex relationships, strikes against Yemen that target hospitals, a school bus, and killings, uh, a we a weddings, I'm sorry, killing thousands of children and civilians. We just cannot ignore such actions. I'm deeply appalled by the ongoing imprisonment of women's rights activists, some of whom have been held in solitary confinement for months and subjected to abuse, including electric shock, flogging, and sexual assault. Women who are speaking up for equal rights and access to something as simple as the right to drive are challenging the male guardianship system and thus have been arrested and subjected to torture and sexual harassment. It's imperative that we send a signal not only to the President of the United States, but also to Saudi Arabia, that while the Trump administration is willing to look away in the interest of Saudi Arabia and some personal relationships, we in Congress view their actions as deeply damaging. So I thank you for this time and for bringing these bills forward. Now you'll back. Thank you, Ms. Titus. Ms. Wild. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and Ranking Member McCall. I want to speak in support of two pieces of legislation we are considering today, H.R. 2037, the Saudi Arabia Human Rights and Accountability Act of 2019, and House Resolution 222, emphasizing the importance of alliances and partnerships. Regarding the first, the killing of Jamal Khashoggi was above all a human tragedy. All of us here today can vividly remember the experience of watching and hearing his fiance testify before this committee last month. Her heartbreak and incomprehension at the cruelty of the act committed were palpable. All of us could see a part of ourselves in her story. But Mr. Chairman, Jamal Khashoggi's assassination was more than an individual incident, as tragic as it was for those most directly involved. This assassination was also an affront to the values, interests, and norms that underpin the international system that the United States helped build in the aftermath of World War II. That international system led to greater peace and prosperity than the world had ever known. Partnerships in international institutions, as imperfect as they are, emerged as mechanisms for resolving conflicts rather than brute force. By assassinating a journalist who was also a permanent resident of the United States in the embassy of a foreign country, Turkey, a NATO member and ally, the Saudi government took actions that directly undermined our nation's principles and interests. They set an unacceptable precedent for other countries around the world. And so far, they have seen very few costs from the United States. This bill, H.R. 2037, is about ensuring that there is accountability for those actions. That means consequences, 
a report from the Director of National Intelligence on those involved in the events and the efforts to impede the resulting investigation, sanctions on those aforementioned individuals, and a full report on Saudi Arabia's human rights record to be presented to Congress. I urge my colleagues on both sides of the aisle to pass H.R. 2037 out of committee with a resounding bipartisan vote. We must come together to send a powerful signal to Saudi Arabia that our nation will stand up for core values and interests with regard to all countries, adversaries and allies alike. I'd also like to speak about House Resolution 222. In December of 1947, in the wake of the devastation of World War II, President Harry Truman delivered a special message to Congress on the importance of supporting our Euro European allies in the task of rebuilding their nations. President Truman wrote, we must decide whether or not we will complete the job of helping the free nations of Europe to recover from the devastation of the war. Our decision will determine in large part the future of the people of that continent. It will also determine in large part whether the free nations of the world can look forward with hope to a peaceful and prop prosperous future as independent states, or whether they must live in poverty and in fear of selfish totalitarian aggression." End quote. As a result of the leadership demonstrated by President Truman and members of Congress, our nation came to the aid of our allies during their time of greatest need. We built a norms-based international system designed to ensure lasting peace an order anchored in alliances, partnerships, and international institutions. But today, alarmingly, far too many of our country's closest allies aren't certain that they can count on us. In some cases, they aren't sure whether we are still a country that keeps our word and honors our obligations. We must remember that we cannot effectively advance our country's interests if we do not stand with our allies. And we must remember that our democratic values our commitment to human rights, and our respect for international norms aren't burdensome obstacles to doing business around the world. They're the very cornerstones that underpin our country's success. House Resolution 222, emphasizing the importance of alliances and partnerships, reaffirms our commitment to the international system that our country helped build. It reassures our allies that this commitment is bipartisan and that we understand those alliances and partnerships. And it calls on the president to make clear that America will never waver in staying true to our allies and the interests and values that bind us together. I am proud to support HR 222 and I urge my colleagues on both sides of the aisle to do the same. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Thank you, Ms. Royal. Mr. Espayan. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, let me uh, congratulate you, Mr. Chairman, Ranking Member, for forwarding uh, this uh, group of uh, bipartisan efforts that will certainly uh, make our, our country safer, make the world safer. It will further our standing in the international community across the planet, and uh, it will address very uh, specific issues that I think are relevant and important, not only to our nation, but to the entire world. I would like to highlight uh, two of the initiatives that we've uh, taken up uh, today. The first one being uh, H.R. 358, headed by Congresswoman Karen Bass of California, calling on the government of Cameroon and armed groups to respect the human rights of all Cameroonian citizens and to end the violence there in that African country and to pursue, pursue a broad-based dialogue without any preconditions to resolve this conflict that could really lead to massive uh, bloodshed between uh, the government and separatists uh, in that country. It is important that we continue to play uh, a mediation role, a leadership role across the world to further uh, democratic values uh, in all continents and obviously including in this uh, African country of Cameroon, uh, to ensure that the rest of the world looks at us as a beacon of hope, an opportunity, because of our commitment uh, to democratic values. So I think that H.R. 358 um, helps us get there and further uh, establishes us 
as a, a, a leader, leader in, the, in, the, in, the, in the international community, particularly in a continent that has uh, looked towards China for investment, has looked to, to China for leadership, perhaps uh, because of a vacuum of leadership that we have uh, left there, and this uh, particular action will help us uh, fill that void, fill that vacuum, and reestablish our footing in such an important continent as Africa. The second, um, Mr. Chairman, the second uh, bill that I would like to highlight, highlight is H.R. 2037, which is the Saudi Arabia Human Rights Accountability Act. And we all know what happened there in Istanbul. We all know that a, a Washington Post columnist, Jamal Khashoggi, went into the uh, embassy, into Saudi embassy, in Istanbul and never came out. And so this is troubling that uh, a nation like the Saudi Arabia uh, will uh, engage in this kind of action and that an MBS, its leader, uh, may have play, play a pivotal role in the disappearance of Khashoggi. Now, we must take into consideration, Mr. Chairman, that this is the country that the current administration wants to sell arms to the same country that was engaged in the disappearance of uh, a journalist uh, is a country that uh, this administration wants to have a close working relationship with. Um, I think this is tragic. I think that we must continue to try to find out what happened to Jamal Khashoggi. Uh, the media and, and journalists across the world uh, must have the ability to communicate what they see and hear to citizens across the world. This is an important part of democracy, the ability to have access uh, to information and data. Uh, it's an important component and pillar of democracy. And of course, the death of Khashoggi sent a ch chilling effect to journalists across the world that if you differ with government, you may wind up dead. And so how could we deal with a, a country like Saudi Arabia? How could we deal with MBS if they're engaging in this over-the-top, heavy-handed and criminal conduct? Uh, so I congratulate Mr. Malonowski for this uh, piece of legislation, and I urge all of my colleagues to vote for this entire package, which I think will further strengthen our role and our place in the international community. I'll yield back, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Espayat. Mr. Phillips. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, uh, for both holding this markup and uh, to you and Ranking Member McCall for once again working together to reach bipartisan agreement on a bill that is so vital to our national security. Uh, as has been stated already, a full State Department authorization bill has not passed Congress since 2002, and it is surely time that we do so. Uh, as Jim Collins, the author of Good to Great, has said, quote, leaders of organizations that go from good to great start not with the where, but with the who. They start by getting the right people on the bus, the wrong people off the bus, and the right people in the right seats. Title III and specifically Section 313 of this bill focuses on the right stuff, the who. Section 313 refers, requires the Secretary to develop a comprehensive five-year strategic staff, staffing plan for the Department that is aligned with the objectives of the national security strategy, including data on current and projected workforce needs. With the help of Representative Spanberger, her wonderful staff, and the expert committee staff on both sides of the aisle, we are able to come up with an amendment that improves upon the language in Section 313. Our amendment ensures that state's report directly addresses the shortages outlined in a GAO report, which state concurred uh, two, entitled Integrated Action Plan Could Enhance Efforts to Reduce Persistent Overseas Foreign Service Vacancies. It also requires the Secretary to issue a report that describes the root causes of foreign service and civil service shortages, their efforts on national security, and proposals to remedy them. Shortages of foreign service officers and specialists overseas is having a profound impact on our national security. For example, at an embassy in Africa recently, when asked what was the biggest detriment to competing with the Chinese, the answer given by the country team was the presence of unfilled FSO positions in the embassy. 
Mr. Chairman, not only is it time for this committee to reassert its jurisdiction in matters of national security, it is also time for the State Department to reassert its jurisdiction. This bill, Title III, and our amendment helped to do just that. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Phillips. Ms. Omar. Thank you, Chairman. I want to thank you and Ranking Member Mr. McGall uh, for bringing these important bills for markup today. I would like to say a few words uh, on some of uh, the bills within this package. First, I absolutely agree that diplomacy and development are critical, uh, are critical national security tools for millions of people around the world their first and sometimes only interaction with the United States is with the military. We project so far too many people that are our only interest in their countries uh, um, and their well-being is that they are a security problem that we need to be solved. When we are fighting the plug of violent extremism, we simply cannot drone the problem to death. We must take a smarter approach that focuses on root causes and brings people to the negotiating table. This is also why the resolution on the importance of democracy, human rights, and the rule of law is so important. Of course, there is a moral argument for putting those things front and center in our foreign policy. And I do sincerely believe we must reflect our values when we engage around the world. But it's not only a moral argument, it's also a pragmatic one. Addressing root causes, empowering communities, insisting that our partners respect human rights, these are proven tools in the fight against extremism and terrorism. When we talk about human rights, democracy, and the rule of law, we must apply those to friends as well as to adversaries. They must be sincerely held principles and not just political weapons to use when it's convenient for us. Mr. Malinowski's bill that is before us today is an important recognition of this principle. Our longtime alliance with, the Saudi Arabia, with Saudi Arabia is under the microscope now. That is long past due. The truth is there is no credibility to our attacks on Iran's human rights record if we don't hold Saudi Arabia, the uh, United um, Arab Emirates, and Bahrain to that same standard. This brings me to the third framing resolution on the importance of alliances. We've seen the disaster of talking dras taking drastic actions without the support of our al al allies in this administration's reckless unilateral approach in Venezuela and in Iran. We are stronger and safer when we work with countries toward common goal and when we play our part in international institutions. But as it is in the case of Saudi Arabia now, our alliances and partnerships should not be written in stone. We should not blindly support regimes that turn into dictatorship or also abuse human rights just because we have been allies with them for a long time. This brings me to HR Resolution 358, the resolution on Cameroon. I'm proud original sponsor of this resolution. And I want to thank my colleague, Ms. Bass, and Mr. Smith for introducing it. Cameroon is a perfect example of a country where a serious and pressing security problem has caused us to approach our policies there with too much emphasis on defense and not enough on diplomacy and development. I applaud the decision to restrict security aid, but for too long we look the other way on the atrocities being committed in the English-speaking region because of our partnership in the fight against Boko Haram. Again, this is immoral, but it's also counterproductive. The solution is important in, in the right, in the step in the right direction. Finally, all of these principles are the reason my amendment to the state authority bill before us today. The Office of Global Criminal Justice at the State Department does crucial work. The United States has been a leader on international criminal justice since Nuremberg, the emergence of international justice framework to confront atrocity crimes is one of the most important innovations of the 20th century. The Office of the Global Criminal Justice upholds this proud American tradition 
of supporting the principle that nobody, no president, no dictator, no king, is above the law. It is dedicated to the mission of saying some crimes are so horrific, they are truly crimes against humanity. My amendment places the Office of Global Criminal Ju uh, Justice where it belongs, as an essential part of our foreign policy and our State Department. Uh, Mr. Chair, I yield back. Thank you so much for your work on this. Thank you, Ms. Omar. Ms. Houlihan. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, uh, for the markup and to you and the ranking member for this amazing bipartisan lift today. Um, as it stands today, in order to be considered for certain civil service positions at the State Department, candidates must have a degree in the humanities. In other words, only those with a background in subjects like political science or international relations can fill these policy positions. What we have then are civil servants working on a complex, complex technical issues like nuclear nonproliferation without any academic background or experience in STEM. I graduated from Stanford with an engineering degree, and had I wanted to pursue one of those civil service positions, I would have been turned away. Instead, I served in the Air Force and ended up working, as it turns out, on issues of nuclear nonproliferation. So I'm speaking from direct personal experience when I say that a background in STEM is a huge asset in dealing in these highly technical issues. To prevent bright people from finding jobs at our State Department, to prevent people with expertise on these specific issues that they would be addressing is counterintuitive. Why would we not want the best people for the job with the most relevant backgrounds? My First Amendment to the State Department Authorization Act allows the Secretary of State to waive any or all job requirements set by the Office of Personnel Management for these types of positions, including educational requirements for candidates who possess significant STEM experience. We need their expertise, especially today when technology and science continue to develop at rapid rates. Thank you to the Chair and to the Ranking Member for including this amendment. The second issue I'd like to elevate today before this committee is paid family leave. While I believe Congress must work towards affording all federal employees paid family leave, this committee must first overcome the hurdle of ensuring that all State Department employees are afforded equal flexibility with respect to leave policy. Currently, each bureau within the department is allowed to set its own guidelines regarding how paid leave may be utilized. Some bureaus allow their employees to use sick days like the birth, for the birth of a, or adoption of a child, while others do not. For many parents, this means asking their colleagues to donate, or donate leave time so that they can take time off to welcome a child to their family without suffering the loss of pay. The department has no standardized policy to provide family leave for its employees, and this is wrong, plain and simple. By requiring the Secretary of State to implement a standard parental leave policy and to submit a report to Congress, my Second Amendment will allow us to assess the impacts of standardized policy and work towards what is right by these dedicated public servants. I and other people deal best in data, and so here is some. The United States exists as the sole and only remaining industrial country with no national family leave policy. One in six Americans spend an average of 20 hours a week every week taking care of a sick or el elderly family member. 25% of new mothers return to work in just 10 days after childbirth. 10 days. As a mother myself, I can promise you that that's not enough. It's time that we take action and that we join the rest of the industrialized world in advocating for workers and their families. And this amendment, my amendment, is a critical first step in addressing an issue that we have neglected for far too long. We in the federal government have the opportunity to lead by example, and this amendment demonstrates our commitment to the men and women at our State Department and to their families. I again thank the chair and our ranking member for including these important amendments in their, in their legislation, and I thank you once again for the chance to speak. I yield back the balance of my time. Thank you, Ms. Houlihan. Mr. Liu. Uh, thank you. Uh, I'd like to commend uh, you, Mr. Chair, as well as Ranking Member McCall for your leadership and shepherding, shepherdizing forward uh, this bill, the Department of State Authorization Act of 2019. I speak now in support of my amendment, which seeks to improve the Department's cybersecurity posture. The language is taken from bipartisan legislation that I introduced with my colleague, Ted Yoho of Florida. It was called the Hack Your State Department Act. That legislation was marked up by this committee and subsequently passed by the full House on a bipartisan basis. Uh, over the years, the State Department has faced mounting cybersecurity threats from both criminal enterprises and state-sponsored hackers. 
In 2014, for instance, the department was infiltrated by Russian hackers and had to temporarily shut down its email system. Last year, the State Department suffered another breach of its email system, exposing the personal information of a number of its employees. As an agency with a critical national security role, we must do more to protect its cybersecurity. Uh, as a recovering computer science major, I recognize that there are proven tools at our disposal to improve cybersecurity that the department has yet to adopt. Uh, my amendment will bring that very tool to the State Department after it was proven so successful both in a private sector and at the Pentagon. Uh, this amendment will do two things. Uh, the first is to establish what is called a vulnerability disclosure process which sets clear rules of, rules of the road so that when people outside the department discover vulnerabilities on department systems, they can report it in a safe, secure, and legal manner. The second step is to actually pay vetted white hat hackers to find vulnerabilities. The Department of Defense proved the success of the bug bounty program in 2016. Over a 24-hour period, the Pentagon learned and fixed over 138 vulnerabilities. Uh, we need to do the same thing for the State Department. And again, I thank Chairman Engel and Ranking Member McCall for their support of this amendment, and I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Liu. Mr. Malinkowski. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I Malinkowski. very strongly support the entire package. Uh, very happy to see that we're moving ahead with uh, the authorization bill. Um, and want to say a few words in particular about my bill, the Saudi Arabia Human Rights and, and Accountability Act. I'm very grateful to you for bringing this forward. I am particularly grateful to Ranking Member McCall for working with us. The result of our common effort is a strong bipartisan statement that it matters to us, it matters to the United States how our partners treat their people that we do not exempt Saudi Arabia from that principle simply because we have a long-standing security relationship, and in particular that we must see accountability for the killing of Jamal Khashoggi. I, I've spent much of my career thinking about how the United States can most effectively advance our commitment to human rights and democracy around the world. It is not always easy. I always acknowledge this is not our only interest in the world. But the Khashoggi case is not just about human rights in Saudi Arabia. What happened to Jamal Khashoggi didn't happen in Saudi Arabia. Khashoggi was a resident of the United States. He had every reason to believe that he was safe here. He was lured to a Saudi embassy and brutally murdered on the soil of a NATO ally. What happened to Jamal Khashoggi is not common. Human rights abuses around the world are common, but what happened to him is not common. Few dictatorships are brazen enough to reach out beyond their borders to kill their critics living overseas. Russia did it recently when it poisoned uh, two of its critics living in the United Kingdom. Iran has reportedly done it several times in recent years, and now we add Saudi Arabia to the list. And it's important for us to remember that despite all of the controversy and anger following the case of Mr. Khashoggi, the Saudis do not appear to have gotten the message. Our intelligence community, since the killing of Khashoggi, has had to warn three individuals living overseas, and including an American citizen living in the United States, of threats from the Saudi government. So we cannot allow this to become the norm in international relations. We have to remember there are thousands of Jamal Khashoggi's living in the United States today in every part of our country. They come to us from China, from Russia, from Cuba, from Iran, from dictatorships around the world. And here they speak out, they write about what goes on in their countries. They should feel safe. So what this amendment does is it requires the State Department to do what it has said is the administration's policy, and that is to hold accountable everybody who is responsible for this brutal crime. It requires the Director of National Intelligence to name the perpetrators, and it imposes visa sanctions on those individuals. It says to the Saudi government that they can have a close and enduring relationship with the United States, but they cannot take advantage of that relationship to get away with murder. And it says something else to the world that's very important right now, particularly given the standoff that we are engaged in with Iran. 
that our concerns about human rights abuses in that country, our concerns about other violations of international law by the regime in Iran are not about the United States blindly taking sides with our Gulf allies. They are about America standing up for principles that we apply equally to everybody. Thank you, and I yield back my time. Thank you, Mr. Malinowski. Mr. Trome. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and Ranking Member McCall. Uh, today's markup includes a number of uh, really important bipartisan bills uh, that help exert congressional priorities for proper management at the State Department. It also allows us to reinforce fundamental principles in our diplomacy, like respect for human rights, adherence to the rule of law, and the need for cooperation with our allies. I'd particularly like to highlight Mr. Malinowski's bill, the Saudi Human Rights and Accountability Act. Next week will mark nine months since the brutal murder of Jamal Khashoggi at the hand of Saudi agents inside the Saudi consulate in Istanbul. Our own intelligence community assesses with high confidence that the Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salam ordered the assassination. Yet President Trump has refused to submit to Congress a determination and responsibility of that killing, a report mandated under the Global Magnitsky Act. Clearly, Congress must take further action to get answers. I'm proud to co-sponsor Mr. Malinowski's bill because it requires the DNI to produce a report with the information we have been seeking from the Trump administration. It's unacceptable that this information has been withheld from us. This is not a partisan issue. We all agree that the cold-blooded blooded murder of Mr. Khashoggi was wrong, and those involved should be held accountable. It's worth noting the United Nations, in its own independent report on the matter, recommended the U.S. undertake a criminal investigation until the execution of Mr. Khashoggi. The U.N. also encourages the U.S. government to publicly release all information related to the murder. We have to be vigilant in demanding responses to these unanswered questions. Under this bill, any current or former Saudi officials, as well as Saudi political figures responsible for ordering, directing, otherwise supporting the murder, would be named and hit with travel sanctions. We absolutely should not allow these individuals free entry or access to the United States. Further, the bill requires a much-needed report on Saudi Arabia's human rights record. Sadly, the killing of Mr. Khashoggi is not the only egregious human rights violation attributable to our security partner. Saudi Arabia is also currently detaining a number of women's rights adv advocates without conviction of any crime for their roles in opposing the male guardianship system and in speaking out against the ban on women driving, even though it came to an end over a year ago. It's important for the U.S. government to report accurately and honestly on these developments as we have serious, frank conversations with Saudi Arabia about the responsibilities they bear to uphold human rights and dignity. For these reasons, I'm glad to see the Saudi Arabia Human Rights Accountability Act move forward in the Foreign Affairs Committee today. And I encourage all our colleagues to join. I want to thank Mr. McCall and Mr. Chairman. I yield back the balance of my time. Thank you, Mr. Trone. Mr. Connolly. I thank the chair. Uh, let me first of all thank the chair and the ranking member for helping return us to regular order in the State Department authorization legislation uh, and for really performing a, a legislative miracle, which is a relatively uncontestable, uh, non-controversial reauthorization. I, uh, I remember, and I believe Mr. McCall and Mr. Engel do as well, um, a, a two-day marathon uh, when uh, Ms. Uh, uh, Ilyana ross Leighton was chair, uh, and we started like at 9 or 10 in the morning and went until 1 or 2 in the morning, two days in a row, with 
incredible amounts of amendments and discussion and debate uh, in an exercise that kind of went nowhere, uh, but nonetheless we did it. And, and this is in sharp contrast to that, and I think it, it really uh, is a testament to the leadership uh, on both sides. Uh, you, Mr. Engel, and you, Mr. McCall, and I, I, I mean it sincerely. I, I was a staffer in the Senate Foreign Relations Committee, and I know I used to be in charge of the foreign aid authorization bill. In fact, we wrote the last foreign aid bill to become law uh, in 1986. And uh, th it's not an easy task. Uh, it looks easy, but it's not. So thank you both uh, for your leadership. I also want to thank you both for uh, including in the, in the final product uh, my amendment um, on legislation that enhances the State Department's diversity and inclusion efforts. Uh, the National Security, Diversity, and Workforce Inclusion Act H.R. 2979 is sort of the genesis of that amendment, and it promotes diversity in federal, na in na federal national security offices. Uh, the authorization bill before us today requires regular reporting on demographic data related to State Department's workforce and diversity efforts and encourages state to expand its recruitment and retention programs to facilitate a diverse workforce. The amendment adds two more key sections from that legislation regarding leadership engagement and professional development. The amendment directs the Secretary of State to implement performance and advancement requirements, recognizing the efforts of senior leaders to foster an inclusive environment. Uh, on professional development, the amendment requires the Secretary to offer a career advancement program for senior positions that encourages diverse participation. Diversity, as we know, is a unique source of strength for America, our economy, and our national security, and by the way, when that diversity is reflected, and for example, an overseas, uh, an embassy overseas, um, it is uh, it is a great um, statement about who we are as an inclusive country uh, and a multiracial, multiethnic country that works. Uh, we must ensure our federal workforce reflects that face of America, that uh, pluralistic America. Uh, and I am delighted uh, that the bill includes that amendment. And with that, I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Connolly. Ms. Spanberger. I'd like to thank Chairman Engel and Ranking Member McCall for their leadership in introducing the Department of State Authorization Act. As a former national security officer who has served overseas, I can attest to the vital work of the State Department and its workforce. Our diplomatic corps, our civil service officers, and the contractors and local staff who support them ensure that U.S. interests and values are upheld around the world. They ensure we pursue diplomatic solutions and prevent conflicts before they start. They ensure we have strong allies and partners who will stand with us in times of crisis, and they ensure we have economic opportunities for American businesses and a safe, secure world for our children. This bill is the first step in doing our part to ensure those officers who represent us at home and abroad are represented here in Congress and have the resources, guidance, and support they need to do their job. I'm proud to support this bill and to introduce a handful of amendments. These amendments would keep the State Department workforce safe from sexual harassment and sexual assault, improve security assistance coordination with the Department of Defense and the Combatant Commands, help Congress and the American people better understand how our military deployments support diplomatic strategies and how our security assistance funding, taxpayer dollars, are intended to provide flexibility to our military to focus on the highest priority threats. I'm also honored to join my friend and colleague, Congressman Dean Phillips of Minnesota and his team uh, to support an amendment that would continue to address the impact of foreign service and civil service vacancies across the department and push for implementation of independent recommendations so we have the strong, capable workforce we need to represent American interests worldwide. I encourage my colleagues to support this important bill and ensure we support the tireless work of our diplomatic and civil service corps. Thank you, I yield back. Thank you, uh, Ms. Spanberger. Are there any other members seeking recognition? Hearing no further requests for recognition then, without objection, the committee will proceed to consider the notice items on block. A reporting quorum is present, and without objection, each measure is considered as read, and the amendments to each are considered as read and are agreed to. The question occurs on the measures on block as amended 
All those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed, no. In the opinion of the chair, the ayes have it. The measures considered on block are agreed to, and without objection, each measure is ordered favorably reported as amended if amended, and each amendment to each bill shall be reported as a single amendment in the nature of a substitute. Without objection, staff is authorized to make any technical and conforming changes. And this concludes our business today. I again want to thank all the members. I especially want to thank Ranking Member McCall uh, for everyone's contribution and assistance with today's markup. The committee stands adjourned. Thank you all.